One Bum Cinema Club, uh, what is it? It's a cinema for uh, One Bum uh, and currently uh, showing a series of animations. Yep, it's a completely automated cinema, so it doesn't require a projectionist or a box office ticket seller. The individuals just approach the cinema, sit in the seat, press the button and enjoy whatever we're showing at the time. So today we are in Worthing at Colonnade House, uh, which is a hometown gig for us. Um, we're taking part in uh, a little festival, Films on the Gallery Wall. Uh, we've been here all day today, uh, it's been great. At the moment it's 100% animation based, which at the, at the beginning was a natural choice and it's become really popular, so we're sort of rolling with it as a bit of an animation showcase cinema, which is working really well at the moment. We met some really nice people as well and everyone's just really excited about what we're doing and how it provides a completely unique facet to our world of animation. You've yeah, had a steady stream of people coming in putting their bum on the seat. It's always popular with kids, and as soon as the kids discover they can press the button again to get more films, it then becomes an issue of trying to get the kids out of the cinema, because they just become, it just becomes their favorite den where they want to hang out, so. Yeah, and I think, you know, people like it, and we're trying to just get it out there as much as possible to the right events, and who knows, might, might just appear in someone's town somewhere. That's pretty good. <laughs>
discount from the the local timber merchant. <laughs> so we uh, that was sort of when it, when we started to think more about how can we get people to support us and help out. So that was sort of right at the beginning of trying to get this thing out from under his stairs because originally it really it was designed to be on in an understairs cupboard. We had no uh, no plans to take it out. So um, it was when a local shop uh, came to watch it under the stairs. They were like, "Can you uh, can you bring this along to our place?" And we were like, "Well, we went along, and it really wasn't going to work just to take the projector and the seat and dump it in the corner of their shop." And um, so it was then that we decided to build this wooden shed. So it's yeah, it hasn't it hasn't been particularly expensive to build. <laughs> I haven't got the receipts here, but um, it uh, it's basically just. A shed. Yeah. When you're sitting in it, it feels feels just like a mini cinema. Um, and so that little film that we just showed kind of does reveal just how wooden and shed-like it is in the construction. When um when you first started, was it animation as well? Why is it only animation? What made what was that decision? Why did you uh, choose to only show animations? Do you want I to take that one for me? Yeah, I think originally we were just trying to make it accessible for all ages and mm. obviously with animations that's much easier uh, but also I quite like the idea of having content that is for adults and children um, and luckily we knew some animators who said yes to submit in their um, films who are with us today actually um, yeah and then we just we we were I don't know, we've just really enjoyed it. People liked it and we've sort of stuck with it since then, really. Just really good short format, funny stuff, isn't it? Really, really accessible stuff. We wouldn't want to sit in there for 90 minutes watching a feature length live action film. Not yet, anyway. We're not ready for that yet. Well, you know, they, uh, with all of the talk currently, it might be the perfect cinema for the situation that we're in right now. <laughs> Have you been a, yeah, I guess you haven't been approached by anyone currently to, to screen it, or have you? <clears throat> We've got a pencil for September. We were um, due to take part in Peckham and uh, Nunhead Free Film Festival, and they're still sort of toying with the idea of trying to do some socially distancing events, which we're obviously made for in one at a time. So yeah. anyway, let's see what happens. This, yeah, exactly. Um, this is actually a question that I wrote down, but we've been asked by uh, a few different people from the audience as well. Is uh, Whose animations do you show? How do you choose uh, or curate the animations that you're showing in the cinema? Um, I just ask them. Uh, <laughs> I just, uh, <laughs> yeah, but where do, where do you go looking for them? That's a, that's another question that came up. Where are you Where are you looking for these animations? It's all really Instagram, isn't it? For all it's all it's started on Instagram and now it's trying to expand into having our own website and sort of having a more focused stream of people that we can communicate with rather than just throwing it out there. But Paulie's uh, Paulie's the the main man when it comes to marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess um, it sort of started just doing some research, some recommendations from friends, um, and then we just quickly discovered that everyone we asked just said yes. So we we were off um, before we knew it, really, with you know twenty odd animators or something that agreed to sort of take part. So so that was great, and it's sort of grown from there, really. Um, it's really struck a chord, hasn't it, with with the animators? It. I mean, as an animator myself, which isn't linked to the project, but as an animator myself, I know that if you can find a, a unique thing to show your work, it's it's quite unusual. Like normally, you'd have to pay to enter a, a you know, animation festival, for example. Mm -hmm. So having what is basically a mini portable animation festival for free is has really struck a chord with all the animators that we've been in touch with. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, we've had some questions from. Uh, UAL Foundation students who have asked, um, would you firstly, would you consider sharing student work pre-degree um, and how, how might they get in touch with you? What's the best way if they did want to show? Um, absolutely, yeah. We've, um, you know, we've sort of taken work from all different areas, different levels, um, and we've just been quite open from day one, really. So 
um, yeah, we'd be more than happy to have submissions. Um, <clears throat> they can contact us via our website or just message us on Instagram. Um, but yeah, you know, we have been obviously, you know, it's, who knows, there's plans to work with sort of universities, colleges, schools um, in the future. I would quite like to sort of work with young people um, anyway, you know, starting out. Um, mm maybe end of year shows, who knows, I'm, I'm, I don't know. But you have yeah. been curating um, some of them, haven't you? You, ha you have been doing uh, screenings around particular themes. Yeah, so Is I that... was going to mention the theme oh, thing. So I think in the, no, I mean, it's, it was um, relevant because we, we've only had one theme so far, um, but we'd like to take that, that idea into the future. And that would obviously help to um, inspire people to create stuff specifically for it or it would kind of provoke certain people to realize that their stuff does fit it's just a really good way of focusing the content rather than just if we throw it out there as we found we get so many people coming to us that it's we end up with hours of content mm. so um yeah i think having a theme has really really helped narrow it down great okay thank you would you guys like to answer some of the questions that we've had sent in from the audience of course Let's let's start with Ali from Worthing. We all know Ali. Um, <laughs> what's been the that's a, what's the, been the most unexpected thing about running one bun? Uh, I think it's been the obviously the positive response we've had has been overwhelming. I think we, we didn't we honestly didn't expect to have have such a response from animators and from vendors wanting to have our little cinema in their in their place um and we honestly didn't expect to have to build it as a shed and take it out into the great wide world it was originally a part of paulie and anna's open house as part of the worthing of artist open houses and so really we've just been rolling with it basically so the whole thing essentially has been an unexpected unexpected journey that we're still just working our way through <laughs> that's great Good answer. Um, another fun one. If you could get any one person to try the cinema, who would it be, famous or otherwise? Thank you, Jam. <laughs> Hi, Jam. Do you have an answer to that? I mean, it's pretty wide ranging. Um, yeah. Go for it. Who comes Matt. to mind? I reckon I'd like to sit Sir David Attenborough inside it and show him one of his nature documentaries. <laughs> yeah, that's probably uh, the best one, the best answer. <laughs> I wonder what you think of it. I think it. My, um, I don't want to draw out this answer too much, but I, I find that this the, this wooden shed with a cinema seat and a cinema inside it is sort of like an old. It's like an old-fashioned way of showing content. Like these days, we have Instagram and YouTube, and um, so I'd like to. Speaking of David Attenborough, it's nice to kind of think of an older, the older generation of broadcasting, um, having a, seeing what their opinion is of it. Because he was um, running the BBC nature documentaries back in the, I don't know when, 60s and 70s. So this is kind of, I feel like we're taking it back, <laughs> back to the old school in a way. And, uh, Definitely. Uh, when I was, when I was um, filming on that day during the Colonnade House Films in the Gallery Wall screening, what I loved was the spectacle of it and how it did cut across all the different, different generations, how it was going into this little, you know, little world of uh, all of these most fantastic uh, and colourful animations and how it did really thrill people to pull back the curtain and go into a different, very private, you know, experience. I thought that was, that was sort of like the circus meets the new, like you said, Instagram. In, in reality. Mm. Um, so you want to take it to other festivals, you want to take it to other shows and things. But another question that's come in is, if you, this is from Sarah, if you could tour one bum to anywhere in the world, where would you go? I guess as, we're, as we are sort of becoming more free in the coming months and years, where would you like to take it? Oh, it'd be nice to go on a road trip somewhere, <laughs> take it across, across seas to another country and really just mm. sort of expose it to a completely new audience because yeah at the moment we're sort of very local um so yeah i'd like to 
We'd have to get a van, Matt, or something. Yeah, okay, we could stick it on the back of a trailer or <laughs> build it into a big Winnebago or something and, and travel it around. I think it's one of those things that needs to kind of just go to city hopping, basically. Who, who knows? Maybe someone can recommend us for Pizza Plasma or something like that. That'd be, that'd be fun. Well, funny you mentioned that. Some of the animators that we've got coming up this evening have, uh, well, one of them spoken at it and the other one's been featured in it. So, you know, let's see if they can link you up. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I'll bring you back in towards the end of the, the conversation. But now we're going to cut to something from Persistent Peril. We're going to watch some Persistent Peril animation. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Enjoy. Cheers. Thank you. Leukemia is scary and mean. It stopped me doing all the things I love to do, even dancing. Leukemia doesn't always win, though. I am stronger than leukemia. Leukemia and Lymphoma Society offer support to people just like me. Every day, more children are beating leukemia thanks to the kind donations from people like you. Please help me and my dad continue to win this battle and donate now. And welcome back. Hello, we are now joined with Garth and Ginny, uh, who along with their producer, Sam Borner, make up Persistent Peril. Hi guys. Hello. Hello Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, so first question, you've been running Persistent Peril since 2011, um, but and these days you're working with some amazing uh, big clients. Uh, what sort, sort of thing were you working on when you first started Persistent Peril? What sort of projects? So we started Persistent Peril um, after making a music video for Three Trap Tigers. Um, Sam had contacted us and said the band were looking to make a video. And we were like, well, it's a lot of work because um, we've been animators um, for a, sort of about 15 years now. And we said, well, if you come on board and sort of help us produce it and help us manage people, we'll do it. And he was like, yeah, sure. And he'd come over in the evenings after his job and help us out. And when that launched, it did quite well. It got on The Guardian and other things. And we were like, well, off the back of this, maybe, you know, we really enjoyed working together. Maybe we should do that. And uh, we did. We started Persistent Peril based on, uh, yeah, noise trade. And I think the first sort of year or so, our clients included The Barbican. And we wow. worked with uh, Shakespeare's Globe, which was really lovely. We were really lucky, actually. We were really, really lucky, yeah. Early that. on, yeah. But I think some of that was having a career beforehand as well. Okay, so you, you were both animators beforehand and you came together with Sam to try something new. What was, what was the project that brought you all together? How did, was, how did you form the company? It was, so it was Noise Trade that brought us all together. Um, it was that yeah, specific think, project, okay. Yeah, we just enjoyed doing that so much that we just thought, well, why don't we just carry on with this? Um, mm. Carry on and uh, see if we can make it sustainable. And, and did that slowly hard. as well, though, yes. <laughs> little yeah. by little. I think it wasn't until like the third year that Sam came mm. on full time. Um, and he was like working essentially two jobs uh, up until then. And that was really amazing time for us. That's when we really knew, okay, this is working now, like, you know, when he could make that transition. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I imagine some people are wondering, what does a producer do alongside the animators? What's Sam doing alongside you? If you're, if you're making the work, what's Sam doing? So Sam manages the clients. He puts together schedules, mm -hmm. budgets. Um, he answers the phone. He just basically makes sure everything's running well and on track. Here also when we need extra people, so we don't do any sound design in house. He, he organises that. If we need freelancers, like often jobs are too big for us to do within the time frame, so we're hiring freelancers, and he uh, makes sure that they're all organised and know when they're starting and stopping. Yeah, he just makes sure that we're on track, doing the right thing, not wasting our time, getting on with stuff. Really, yeah. isn't he? 
And he's much better yeah. on the phone than we are. Yeah, well. much better. Than we are. <laughs> you, need, you need someone to charm people. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> charm um, them. Send out the bearded one. And another sort of another question about the specifics of it all. Um, you you're both animators, um, but does that mean that you're doing the same things, or does one of you do uh, the sort of character design and somebody else do the backgrounds? How does it work? How do you uh, work together as as two animators on a project. So we both have sort of different um, sort of skill sets, really, yeah. um, sort of within it. So Garth does a lot of the design and illustration work. Um, I'm, it, it, sort of illustration is not my strong point, and I do a lot of the editing. We're both character designers, a uh, character animator, sorry, but Garth can also do some motion graphics. So um, he tends to do that as well as some character animation. Whereas I'll just do the character animation. A normal project would normally start with the two of us bickering endlessly, trying to come up with a, you know, something that we feel like works. And then Ginny would write like a nice treatment and I kind of hone the ideas right down and then come to me and say, this is, you know, this Draw is it. where we're at. Draw it, make it look nice. How can we make this work? And then whilst I'm doing that, Ginny will do an animatic. So she'll block out everything that needs to happen. And that can even be just sometimes, if it's a music track, just editing uh, like, you know, like colour bars just to a piece of music, just so we can find the rhythm and find the idea and really like hone it. I really, time doing yeah, our work. I really like editing. I think, yeah, just do stuff to sculpt out the, the film in that stage. That's kind of my, my favourite part. And then you're great at setting all the characters up and doing turnarounds and really sort of working out what fingers look like and how do they blink and kind of honing all that stuff down while I'm designing all the backgrounds and getting all those assets ready. And then we sort of come together for animation, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's... It's something that struck me because you seem to have a really cohesive um, character design style and animation style across all of your projects. I know that you change into different styles as well, but because you have a persistent peril look, it seems like it's the work of a, a single author. And that seems to be something that's, you know, apparent in quite a lot of animation. So it's amazing to hear how you, you do work together in that way um, and to take us through that uh, creative brief. Um, and now that you are working on those larger projects, do you have like a dream project that you're, you're you you would you'd love to 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 work oh, on? Jenny? No, I, um, dream project. Uh, do you know I really like installations. I'd like to uh, maybe work on a haunted house uh, one day wow. and do uh, an element uh, animated elements for that, or just come up with the whole concept. Like um, I think anything where you can take animation into the real world um, projections. On building, especially if you can do something live, imagine like a, a big creature that can talk to kids like on the street and like, or a, we've, we've even talked about in the past, like maybe projecting a, a massive bookworm into a library, but having it attached to a live like actor who can then interact with the kids and talk to them about their books or read them. I'd love to do something. So again, like taking it out of the screen and, and putting yeah. it somewhere else. I mean, I've seen you guys do that. You've done it in the gallery with the animated um, uh, pictures. Yes. Yeah, it's a gallery, as it were, where you used uh, augmented reality through your phone to make your pictures come uh, to life. It was, yeah, wonderful. Um, would you guys like to have some questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, please, yeah. So we had a question earlier from somebody simply going by the name Lan. Uh, how do you form a studio? Quite general. <laughs> I mean, you've done it's that a little bit, but I think what they, what, what they probably, well, I don't want to speak for them, um, but yeah, how do you go about it? Um, I think it's a case of finding who you like working with. That's the best thing about being a studio is working with people that you like. So um, Sam is my best friend from college, Gus, my husband. And um, if you get on with those people, like for a coffee, you'll you know probably get on with them um, in a studio environment. But also make sure you all have different skills. There's no point all three of you wanting to like if in, in our instance if all three of us were illustrators and none of us are animators none of us wanted to deal with the clients it wouldn't work um and then once you sort of form that group of core people where you're like no we can do a project maybe try and do something for free or enter a competition and then when you're ready to go it's a case of searching gumtree for cheap computers and just make it happen we got a studio uh, right off the the right the the beginning like we were always in our own office but you know you could work from home you could work remotely doing this um but yeah and again we started you know slowly with sam our producer not being full-time full and sort of working our way up to that position where we were like not just a collection of freelancers anymore but like actually you know a team and full-time and all there together every day yeah and, and that's when things really like kicked up and really worked really well for us 
but it's just that that horrifying super scary leap but these things are so much easier now like technology has come a long way and you can work remotely with different people and I think that's yeah like surely helped you know hundreds of studios come together yeah. great thank you another Instagram question actually these are linked to together but from totally different people um it's more of a request that says can you please do a short film with Owen Davy because <laughs> yes. you've, you've done some uh adverts for his books haven't you yeah, we'd love to do a short film with Owen. Um, That's uh, a question for Owen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> would he tolerate you say that? that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, that would be really awesome. Like a music video or something would be really good. Um, and something we'd really like to do. Owen's actually been sharing, uh, before the lockdown, Owen was sharing their space in our studio and we all really got on really well. So that was really cool. Um, yeah, it was nice yeah. having Owen. Maybe, like maybe that will happen. Well, the next question is from Owen. Ah, okay. <laughs> Have you developed any techniques for getting yourself out of a creative rut? So I think maybe he's asking for himself. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, we, what well, Sam always says at the beginning of any project, we bicker like we're going to split up. And then we both seem really happy and have a cup of tea. And then he knows the project's going to go well from then on out. So we argue, we argue because we've got such a strong relationship. And we've been working together for so long. We know how far we can push each other without it breaking. And so we can actually get a lot of things done quite quickly because we don't have to be like, how am I going to say this politely or nicely or not offend that person? We just offend each other until we get to the right point in the project and that we're happy to then go ahead. And the other thing I would say is just, um, and Owen does this anyway because I see him drawing all the time, but it's just like have a have a sketchbook, you know, like it's what everyone says, but it, it does work. So many of our... Like every one of our music videos or anything personal we've ever made has come from like a doodle or a no, or normally like a failed pitch for a client where we're there just like, no, this is too weird. This is, this is too far. This is too strange. And we're just like, well, we love it. So let's make it ourselves. And then that way you can really like hone it in. So just keep, just keep having those ideas and keep doodling and eventually like let yourself go off on a tangent and see where it leads. The other thing I was going to say is deadlines. Um, we always find like either working, so if we're making a, uh, uh, short film, personal film or whatever, like aiming for some festival, picture person is always a big one for us. Um, having like a hard deadline. I think we see so many of our friends start what seem like amazing project, project projects, but without a hard deadline, sort of six years later, they're still talking about it. And yeah. um, whereas I find a hard deadline, you know, you are, but like when you get near to it, you're like, why am I doing this to myself? Like, um, it is, it's what gets work done. Great, thank you, really valuable. Um, and then a very specific animation question uh, from someone. Uh, what program would you guys recommend for flat 2D animation? Oh, Animate all the way, yeah. Um, I know that what was that? Animate, Adobe Animate, so fl okay. old Flash. Um, I love Animate because you can go from doing symbol animation to hand-drawn back to symbol. A lot of software is good at one, a lot of software is good at the other. I know loads of people love Photoshop at the moment, and if you've got time, Photoshop's an incredible tool. But um, in terms of like production and workflow, I yeah, we do everything in Animate. Well, all our character animation in Animate, not everything. No, that's great. We design it's awful. Awful. <laughs> awful. <laughs> well, thank you both uh, very much. I'm going to bring you back in at the end of the chat to, to for a roundup. Um, sure. But thank you very much. We are now going to see some work from the amazing Laurie Rowan. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Welcome, animator, illustrator, writer, director, anything else? Dancer? Yeah, infrequently, but yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let's get straight into it. Um, colourful, fun, wobbly and satisfying. That's what it says on your website. Is that how you mm -hmm. describe yourself or is that how someone else has described you? Me or the work? 
of the work. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, yes to both, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah, I would. Um, I have trouble describing it, I think, because it's sort of, I mean, it, I, I make them short for the reason they should be sort of self-explanatory, I suppose. But yeah, I think it's kind of, you know, a sense of joy, a sense of celebration. That's what I want them to, to be. Colourful and silly. Open to interpretation. They're, I mean, you say the word silly, but they don't, they, they have a sort of sculptural and sort of higher brow style, styling to them sometimes. They look like sort of kinetic sculptures. But falling back through your Instagram, as I, as I was doing, it, you used to illustrate and animate in lots of different styles. And then I noticed, as I'm sure some other people have noticed, in June 2017, it was like overnight, you, you developed a whole new world. Uh, the, the, and this style began what happened yeah that's true isn't it um i think it's just a few things coalesced i, I had a big change of heart i suppose i i mean the principal thing is i went to to this conference in berlin um and just became insanely jealous and inspired by the work of other people there who were kind of a lot more autonomous than i was at that stage so i'd been working as an animator for a long time uh, and my principal concern was technique as opposed to creativity. And I'd, I'd kind of forgotten that was my ambition for a long time, that I wanted to make something that was, well, that was creative. I knew I, have, I hadn't cultivated a voice yet, but I knew that I had something that I wanted to say, not in any literal term, I'm not quite sure what it is, but... Um, and I kind of remembered that. And so I set myself a, a challenge to just start putting things out to a schedule, not be too precious about it, but to concentrate on concepts as opposed to just the technical aspect of the software where I had been previously. So I think that's the point that that came. And then I saw a couple of things that inspired me, like this, this bar house ballet. And I think being introduced to that was an aesthetic that I understood on a sort of instinctual level. Mm. Um, and had the realization, oh, you can do things like that. You can express yourself in that way. And, um, yeah, it was just like, it documents a period of just becoming very excited by things, I think. I mean, and you really notice it. I think that's, what it, that's why it was so shocking to go back to that point in Instagram and that's see that you were trying lots of different things. And then suddenly, it's, I guess it's your voice. You, you're, like you're saying, you stopped limiting yourself through these other ways and allowed yourself to play, which yeah. I think is really clear. And, and really fantastic to see. Um, oh, what I've written down here is um, on your also on your website. When looking at what you were doing, uh, you've list, you listed um, the amount of GIF views that you've had as six hundred million. And oh, as yeah. I, I said to you just before the chat, I was very happy to tell you that you're now at seven hundred and ten million on Giphy alone. Um, so gifts, why, why, why do you, put, I mean, apart from just how popular they, they have been, what, what's sort of the, the desire to make gifts? Why do you, why do you share them and uh, make them? Um, I mean, the main thing I put things out on is Instagram. Um, and so there's a whole different thing, you know, it's a, it's a slightly higher fidelity thing, and usually accompany it with some music, like you heard in the clips. Like, I, I guess the cynical answer for the gifts is that you get numbers like 720 million, like if I did you know, just recorded a, a video of a dog dragging its bum across the ground, like you, a million people would watch that on uh, Slack, <laughs> something like that. So it's a really good yeah. thing to put, put on my website. Um, but I mean, non-cynically, it's just a, a nice way to share something really quick and fun, you know, it's, um, and it could just slip into different contexts. People use them in certain ways. I've, I've always found that interesting, that, mm. that things get recontextualized. I think gifts are really good, a uh, little indication of that. So, I mean, the one that I've done with this spinning head, you know, a lot of people kind of reuse that about being about schizophrenia, or they might say it's, you know, about the kind of all the different motions in one day or all the different things that one person can be. Um, and it's a very neat way to sort of encapsulate that within a conversation, I suppose. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. No, they, they do take on a kind of a new poetic meaning. They're, they're great. Um, before we discuss any more, we're now going to cut to a, a clip of your work in quite a different context. Um, and then we'll have a little discussion about that as well. Okay, so, great. No. Back. 
So can you tell us a little bit about what we just saw? What was that? Yes, that was um, a short film for Fact Gallery, which is a gallery in Liverpool. It's the, um, I think it's the, the Facility of Arts and Cultural Technology. And it's part of a wider project. There was three films in this series, uh, and they were funded by Canvas, which was a subsidiary of the Arts Council, the kind of youth focus. And the idea was to draw footfall to lesser visited cultural institutions or regional cultural institutions. Um, and the brief was really, really basic. They just said, um, interpret the gallery uh, any way you see fit, really. So I decided to do it through a, a tour through my characters. Um, and it was, it was a really interesting project. I hadn't done something like that before. I hadn't really played with live action. And also the limitations of the set, you had to sort of find an interesting way to find limitations to play off with the characters. So originally I thought, you know, it's a gallery, so I guess it'll be about the work. But then it turned out that we weren't allowed to make a film about contemporary artworks because there was all sorts of copywriting issues. And yeah. so we weren't actually allowed into the gallery spaces. So it became apparent we're actually making a film about a massive corridor. Um, and so I went on a recce day to go and see how people use this space and kind of what I could draw from that. And it turned out that what a lot of people actually used it for was as a, as a thoroughfare to sort of get quite a convenient shortcut between uh, two roads because it's sort of on a corner uh, and the toilet because they had really nice clean toilets. So that didn't seem a substantial thing to make the film about. So it ended up becoming a film about architecture because it was a really interesting building as it would do anyway, I think, but it really reinforced the point that this needs to be the focus. And so it sort of became a, a film about representing the unique experience of going through this building through a series of characters and, and um, could react directly to surfaces of the building, but also just kind of sense of scale. So it was really interesting to interpret all those things through like a myriad of these different mm. funny characters. Um, I actually worked with Matt on that one from One Bum. He did the um, the motion tracking for me on that one. So he, uh, he tracked the characters along the Putting them into the space. Yeah, yeah. So mapping all the yeah all the camera footage and turning that into um, interpreting that in three D space. Just talents know no limits. Yeah. Um, so you don't sound particularly daunted about having to step out of an animated world into the real world, bringing those characters. And I guess, is that is that how, where you find yourself now as a director? You know, it's you don't mind what you're working on as long as you're bringing your ideas to it. Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, I mean, I guess it's because you have the security of having people who know that element of it. So like when I did the, the fact thing, I was, I was working with a really good director of photography who who was able to, to make sure that we got what we needed on the shoot. And then I had the security of, of working with Matt, who was very technically minded and was able to, you know, distill that down. Uh, and that's the same principle in direction. I think, yeah, principally it's the idea. Um, and if you've got the people around to, to make that happen and you know how to do it, and you know how to express the idea, then I think it's, you know, obviously it is, it is a daunting thing to make anything to a budget and to a time. Mm. Um, and when it needs to happen and when there's people relying on you, obviously those things are, are daunting. But I, I guess it's a, a thing of, of, of just trying to drill down that things are, that daunting things are opportunities. And focus on that aspect of it. <laughs> and make sure that's more than just a mantra you say to yourself, you know. And are you finding, you recently joined uh, the agency Nexus as a director on their books. Mm -hmm. um, from going from being a freelance animator and illustrator and director to going into an agency what are the differences what's changed what are you working on um i guess the stakes are higher the jobs are, are, are bigger um i mean I, I get the kind of projects too that i wouldn't know how to approach or get myself independently so that's great um and it's also just having the access to people who are really top of their field in various different ways, you know, I don't have to impose such limitations on myself anymore. So, you know, I guess the concepts are, are, are tethered to your capabilities as well, and it's just extended those capabilities. So you can do what you really want to do. I suppose that's that's the, the big thing. Obviously within 
certain limitations. But um, but yeah, it's just it's extended the horizon, I guess. That's great. Yeah, what an advert for agencies. <laughs> um, okay, uh, you working on anything exciting now, currently? That you can yeah. tell us about. Uh, I'm doing a couple of my own animations at the moment, so I haven't done that for a little while. And, um, you know, the lockdown's given me an opportunity to just to, to get some stuff done. So that's been nice. Um, so I'm hoping to put something out in the next week or so. Um, I've been writing a lot. Uh, so I've been working with uh, my writing partner. We've been putting together this sitcom that we've been working on for a few years and we're sort of we're in discussions about that. Uh, it's about the extent I can say about that, but that's that's quite exciting. Um, I've been really enjoying your short stories on your website. Um, oh, uh, thank you. They're just yeah, like, well, they have an element of your animations to them. Mm. This, the, the, the other, the bizarre, the, the twist, they're really, yeah. Oh, really brilliant. Great. Yeah, I want to do more stuff like that. I think that's the thing, that's probably the next thing, is, is just getting more of a handle on writing. Mm been dragging my feet on it uh, for a long time and sort of dabbling with it and not fully committing so it's um yeah it's, it's something I really want to get my my head into and sort of figure out quite how this world of the animated world and how writing sort of coalesce because I think it's quite a jumping off point to sort of abstract my characters to that point where they took on an alternative logic and I'm not entirely sure how to do that in the written form at the moment so my stories still tend to have a kind of a real world setting mm. will be rooted in that and sort of slowly finding a way to to bring those things together and abstract it all in such a way that it's still satisfying for someone who doesn't live in my head i think yeah well merging the two as as you did in the uh the, the film in the the gallery yeah well no not not in terms of like literally having it in real world but just sort of find a way to write narratives in a an alternative world that these oh, finding the could, tone. could occupy. Yeah. You know, finding you know, finding the, the tone. And, yeah. No, that's, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Would you like to take some audience questions? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yes, please. You've got some fans uh, with uh, particular interests. Oh. So, SK Schaefer, what sporting events could you best Crocodile Dundee at? I don't know why I've started with that one, but it caught my eye. Okay. Does that mean throwing a tin can? I think it just means, could you do any sports better than Crocodile Dundee? Absolutely not. No, I'm not a very physically based person. Physically based person? Matt, what is that? <laughs> physically, I, I am. I Just am floating around like a ghost. Team. Yeah, I am an ethereal presence, so no. No, okay. That's the last non-animation related question I'm going to go to. Um, ah, this is a nice one from Ryan. Are your characters part of a, co a cohesive world that you're building? Um, I think just by virtue of, of, of coming from me, I suppose, yeah. Um, they're all underpinned by a certain logic, but no, I have got an idea around something like that that's basically like a big anthology of these types of characters that's, you know, the only common element being that they could exist in this sort of, in my version of an Acme universe, I suppose. Mm. So well, sometimes it does not feel currently, like, but yeah, I'd like them to be. Like landing on a different world with them. Because, yeah. <laughs> Uh, how, how important is social media to your business? Pivotal, yeah, really important. Um, that's where everything's become known and I don't really know how I'd put it out into the world without social media, so yeah, incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, as we were saying about Instagram and that pivot. Um, and the last question somebody's asked in this point, unless there's any on here, I've maybe got two actually, is uh, how did you get into motion graphics and do you have any tips? I mean, would you even, yeah, describe uh, yourself as working within motion graphics? Yeah, I, I guess I would. Yeah, I would. Um, I've been, I'm having to do it for about 13 years. So I started uh, in a very small company. There wasn't really a hierarchy. Um, but it should have been, and I should have been a junior animator. Um, so I started for low pay and sort of learned on the job. Uh, and then over years just got progressively better by the virtue of doing it every day. You know, study it if you have the opportunity to. Um, it's just time, just spend a lot of time. 
uh, learning things and making sure you you filter it through your own personality and your, your own voice, I think. Mm. No, so, yeah, perfect. just do tutorials. <laughs> and now, yeah, there's so much available. And, and yeah. for some people, a lot of time. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, very last question. Uh, who would you like to, uh, no, sorry, your ultimate client. Do you have an ultimate client on your dream list? Who would you love to do something for or with? Uh, probably Adult Swim. I always loved Adult Swim's animation. Uh, and they do really daring, interesting stuff. It feels like a high bar to aspire to because you feel it sort of needs quite What a, sort of things uh, do they produce for people that might not have heard of them? Uh, I guess the most well-known thing is Rick and Morty. Mm. Um, but they do a lot of sort of 10 minute shorts, which are just really esoteric and, and quite odd and either very stupid or very cerebral or just play with kind of really interesting, often quite menacing ideas. Um, it just feels like complete free reign and has a lot of integrity. Uh, so yeah, I think they do the most interesting stuff. Um, outside of that, I don't know, maybe some musicians um like to do some some videos that musicians really like like jerry paper or igloo ghost or that sort yeah. of thing i don't know yeah well hopefully they're watching now <laughs> um well thank you um i'm going to bring you back in at the end of the chat for a roundup but thank you for telling us a little bit more about your work and yeah you're welcome it's been a pleasure thank you been, yeah really great finding out about it so we're now going to go to a tiny break as i bring everyone back in actually so you're going to stay here oh okay so see you in a sec <laughs> all right <Thanks. laughs> so everyone will emerge back with us momentarily right. Um, because we've got a waiting room. Everybody should be, uh, you know, very familiar with Zoom calls right now. Yeah. Uh, but they will all start to pop back into here. Um, let's oh. see what other questions. Oh, hello, Paulie. Uh, we've got any other questions coming in live here? Yeah. Hello. Hi, welcome back. Hello. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <coughs> Uh, so we're doing a little roundup now. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being part of this and, and uh, sharing your experiences and for uh, One Bum Cinema for organizing it with me uh, tonight. Um, so to sort of round off, what I'll say is we'll be sharing all of everyone's social media links in the show notes uh, when we re-upload this, and we will uh, do that across on our social media as well. Could I ask each of you... Um, to recommend a creative or an animator that we should be following or looking out for so we can spread this out further. Um, let's start with Ginny and Garth. You got any recommendations for people to check out, recommend? Um, I really love uh, David O'Reilly. He's the um, first sort of animated director that I saw that made me think, oh, that's exactly what I want to do. Um, yeah, so he would be my recommendation. Oh, I thought we were just going to have one meet. Oh, you can have one too, Garth, if you want. <laughs> you can share. I've heard of him, but Laurie Rowan, he's, he's just magnificent. <laughs> like, just Who check him like out. <laughs> thanks, thanks, guys. Well, that's gone through to you, Laurie. Who would you recommend? And you don't have to say Persistent Peril. No, please don't. No, I, Laurie Rowan oh, no. is... Um, uh, <laughs> um, Don Hertzfeld is probably one of the people that got me into it. Um, and in terms of an Instagram account, there's one I really like called Tux and Fanny, which is T-U-X and Fanny. Um, and that's someone who made these, I think, like one minute animations, but he's made about a feature length film's worth. And it's, it's very odd, very experimental. It's really interesting. You can watch the whole thing on Vimeo or you can scr scroll through the account on Instagram. Tux Great. and Fanny. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Uh, how about you, Paulie? Any recommendations? Uh, I would like to recommend uh, someone called AJ Jeffries, uh, who I've recently discovered, and uh, he's just submitted something to us, which I absolutely love. So that's my one. Great. Thank you. How about you, Matt? Uh, I realised that when we were talking, I mentioned a shop asked us to put our, our uh, cinema in their 
in their premises. And that shop, I'd like to give them a special shout out. They are neighborhood store underscore Shoreham. Well, they are the neighborhood store in uh, Shoreham by Sea, and their Instagram is neighborhood store underscore Shoreham. And they've, uh, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have this traveling cinema. So we owe them a lot, and we're really thankful that they supported us back in the day. So please go and support them because they're obviously trying to get through this lockdown, lockdown time as well. So yeah, special shout out to them. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, for everyone out there, please continue to follow uh, Colonnade House uh, with what we're doing uh, as we uh, begin to look at opening the gallery up again, uh, but continue to do things online. Massive uh, thank you to Lloyd of Comedia, who's been putting this on for us through Zoom and through YouTube and all of that wizardry. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, and to Paulie, who helped uh, set this up through all of that as well. Um, so that's everything for now. We're going to close with a beautiful film by uh, Big Egg Films, uh, who are over in Brighton, of One Bum Cinema Club in action at Unbarred. Do you guys want to say, Matt or Paulie, do you want to say anything about this uh, before we go into it? Uh, yeah, this was just a... Um, we did a collab with uh, Lolly Studio, who are a Brighton-based uh, animation studio. Uh, theme was food and drink, and uh, they did a brilliant job of just basically getting so much brilliant work submitted. Um, and it was in Umbar Brewery, uh, well, unfortunately, just for two weeks until they closed. Um, but anyway, we got to do the launch and got this film made. So, uh, yeah, here it is. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Richard. Um, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. yeah, cheers, Richard. Pleasure. All right. And Good night, everyone. everyone for watching. <laughs> I'm Paulie and um, yeah, I'm part of One Bum Cinema Club. My name's Matt and I am the technician behind One Bum Cinema Club. We are a free to visit cinema specialising in local and international animations. And the idea came with a conversation with my partner um, and we wanted to do something fun in our understairs cupboard as part of uh, Artists Open Houses Trail. Uh, luckily we had a couple of uh, neat friends who made animations. Uh, we were approached by someone else to take the cupboard to their shop and so the one bum was born. In this case, for the event at Umbar Tap House, we collaborated with Lolly, who are a Brighton-based animation studio. They've gone out into the world, communicated with all of their animators, got together an incredible amount of material. We run it on a system that you, each time you press our unique little button that dims the lights, you get a different showreel. It's been amazing having One Bum Cinema here. It's very like unique and very cosy and I felt very special being in there. Once you're sat in that single seat, you just feel like you're totally isolated and you can just shut up from everything else. It's lovely, it's really nice that uh, they're showcasing lots of new, new artists and they're, they're sort of pairing them up with more experienced uh, animators. It was bloody brilliant and I wish I had one in my house. It's super engaging with the customers um, and I 100% recommend it. We can build it on site in any location. One day I'd like to put it in a forest somewhere in the middle of nowhere and someone just discovers it for themselves. It's really struck a chord with um, not only the animators but also the people that are enjoying it as well. We try to provide a unique experience where it's one bummer at a time.